it's nice to be back in my home city, um, back up in Newcastle. I am curator of archaeology for Leeds Museums and Galleries, but I'd like to um, point out that Kate Isles, who's my colleague at Bristol Museum, has been delivering these same sessions in the South. So we've actually worked on this talk together and put the PowerPoint together, um, both of us together, so we make sure that we're covering the same things across the country. So um, as Gail says, I'm also secretary for SMA. I've worked at Leeds Museums. I worked out today, this is my 15th year, which is slightly terrifying because it doesn't feel like that long. Um, collections, care and management of archaeological collections is a huge topic, as Gail said. We could very, very easily spend the next three days just looking at all the different ways you should care and manage for your collection, but I've got an hour. <laughs> so what we're going to do is really touch on lots and lots of different things to consider when you are looking after an archaeological collection. And I'll put on lots of different websites and resources for you. As Gail said, they're made available at the end, so you don't feel that you have to write absolutely everything down from the slides. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through it very, very quickly. If you take away one thing today, really, as Gail said, it's that you are part of a really large support network, that there are people you can ask. You don't have to feel like you're on your own. And we're all in this together just because we're standing up here saying this is what you should do does not mean that we are perfect and our stores are beautifully curated with every single object in its perfect place because if you came to Leeds Museums and Galleries and saw some of the storage and I'll show you some pictures of it it's you know there are challenges for all of us so we're all working towards the same thing so never be afraid to come and ask um, any of us anything and if we don't know we certainly know who to ask to get the answers so um, SMA is the really good port of call for that so um, every, I will also say that every institution does things slightly differently. So a lot of the examples I'll be using are from Leeds because that's where I work. But they'll do things slightly differently in Worcester or in Bristol. And my colleagues here may just chip in as I'm talking to give other examples because the way we do it at Leeds isn't the way. It's just one of many ways. But we're all just trying to get the same outcome in looking after our collections. So over the next hour then, um, this is what I'm going to be covering. What is an archaeological collection? So what are you likely to find in your archaeological collection? And that can differ from place to place. How to develop an archaeological collection. So really looking at how you collect and really getting your collections development policy um, sorted out to reflect the significant objects that you want in your collection. How to manage your collection. So this is more um, practical tips about things like cataloging, storing, um, object movements access for researchers, all those things that we do every day. Other considerations, so I'm just going to touch really briefly on developing a human remains policy and numismatics really briefly, just because often within archaeology there's also numismatics, which is kind of a separate discipline, but often falls within the boundaries of archaeology, so I'm sure many of you have to look after coin collections as well. And then further resources, so there's lots and lots of websites and links where to go to find out all the guidelines that we're talking about and do some further reading. So that's quite a lot. Is there a clock in here that I can see? All right, I have no, I'll have no idea what time it is, so you'll just have to tell me um, if I'm overrunning. Actually, yeah, actually, yeah, that would be great. I do have a tendency to Thanks. go on. <laughs> Thank you. So defining an archaeology collection then. So what you will have in your stores in terms of archaeology, and some of you um, might be new to managing archaeological collections or completely new to museums, and others might um, be sort of collection specialists in other areas that you've taken on archaeology. So some of this might be really familiar, and to other people it might all be brand new information. So do um, bear with me. But what is an archaeology collection? So really... Um, Archaeological collections can very broadly be divided into two types. You have your archaeological archives that come in from excavations, which I'm not really going to focus on. Deb's going to focus on that in the next session, all about archaeological archives. But really, for us and Leeds anyway, they make up the bulk of our collections, and we still collect those. The rest of the collection is more um, individual objects. Lots and Leeds anyway have come in in the 18 and 1900s. They make up the sort of nucleus of our historic collections. 
And certainly in Leeds, we were established nearly 200 years ago by the Leeds Philosophical and Literary Society, so they went out and collected from across the world. So we have um, collections within archaeology that reflect these practices in the 1800s. So we have Egyptology, Greek and Roman, European-wide collections, Near Eastern, North American, Indian. So we have archaeology from all over the world. You might find in other museums that Egyptology, for instance, isn't in archaeology. I think it's, is it World Cultures in Bristol, I believe. Sometimes these departments are, but departments are very arbitrary and they can be under different umbrellas. But really, um, so technically speaking, in Leeds, archaeology ends in the year 1539, which is because we look after a medieval monastery and it was shut down by Henry VIII in 1539. So if something's dated 1540, it would be in social history. That's where we, our dividing line is, technically speaking. However, what is unique about archaeology is really the process of how something is recovered. So anything that is excavated or dug up or found with a metal detector comes into archaeology. It doesn't matter if it's from prehistory. It doesn't matter if it's from the 1980s. It would come into to archaeology because it's the process of recovery that makes it archaeology. And there are huge overlaps with other collections, things like, um, we've talked about world cultures in Leeds, all the archaeology of Africa, the archaeology of South America, the archaeology of China is all in world cultures. So it's a really kind of false divide. Um, but also we have lots of animal remains, animal bone, osteology, which overlaps with natural science collections. We have textile fragments, which overlap with our costume and textile collections. We've got beautiful works of art, which could arguably be in our art collection. So really, archaeology is everything. It spans thousands of years of history, and it's global, and it can be everything. So in a way, we have to prepare ourselves to look after a really wide range of material. So I like showing photos like this, because it looks like we're incredibly, all our objects are very beautiful. All these are um, objects on display in Leeds, and they've all been photographed really nicely. So objects can look like this, beautiful, display-worthy um, objects from around the world. Everything from a Roman mosaic to wall plasters to an Egyptian mummy to Cypriot ceramics. It can also reflect um, prehistory, so everything from boxes and boxes of flints to Bronze Age axe heads and Neolithic uh, axe heads. We have textile fragments preserved from the Neolithic Swiss lakes. And beautiful treasure, which Gail's going to talk about in the late session. This is the West Yorkshire Hoard, which came to us in 2012. Beautiful group of Anglo-Saxon jewellery. So really sort of high quality. And we have human remains collections. And I will touch on human remains as I go through, because many of us will look after human remains. And they are something to consider um, with an extra level of consideration and slightly differently because of all the ethical issues that they bring as well. But then, on the other side of the scale, we have boxes and boxes of greyware sheds, CBS, ceramic building material, shells, just things that we've never probably put on display, but we hold for research. And um, you know, everything has a historical value, whether it's beautiful or not. So it's giving everything that we have a value. And we have one big shared store um, in Leeds, so all the departments share it, and I'm probably the one who's mostly in trouble for suddenly putting piles of boxes in the middle of it, because as archives come in, it's always trying to create more space for where, for where they're going to go. So um, for every beautifully laid out shelf, there are shelves and shelves of quite messy, dirty boxes, which look like they're about to fall apart, covered in ceramic residue. So um, it's not all... So there's some of our stores in Leeds. Lots of, um, lots of shelves on the left there that really well-organised archives that have come in. On the right are Stuart boxes, which house our metalwork collections. And our largest object, uh, Kirkstall Abbey, which is a 12th century monastery. And we have all the historic excavations that have come along with that site as well. So there were excavations at the Abbey in the 1950s and 60s, and again in the 70s and 80s, which have generated a huge volume of material for us uh, to store. Some of it really um, great display were these small finds, um, like these which are on display. But again, we have lots and lots of boxes. These were only deposited 
last year but had been in off-site storage for a long time since the 1980s and are sort of slightly falling apart. And these are all things that we have to deal with. Um, and for most of us, I mean, there is only me who deals with archaeology for these museums and galleries, but I still consider us quite lucky because I only deal with archaeology. Obviously, many places, you're looking after lots of different departments. And some of these sites at least are published, which is wonderful. Um, many sites in our care are not, which brings its own um, issues. So archaeology then, there's lots of special considerations, things that make archaeology unique. There's the whole archaeological process and everything that means, and, and Deb will talk about this, but it's you're not just always taking in objects, it's paperwork, it's photographs, it's everything that comes along with um, an excavation. And you have a resource rather than displayable material. Often you have boxes and boxes of objects which you might never display, but you have to see them as a historical resource. And it's, it may be the fastest, well, it certainly is in Leeds, it's the fastest growing collection. So we bring our um, acquisitions to a panel every month, and usually, you know, curators want to acquire this and that, and then there's me with several archives worth of material that has to be approved. So just the, the volume of it can be quite a challenge to manage. And I've talked about overlaps with other collections, um, but at the bottom point that sometimes, as well as being beautiful and intricate, they can be large, bulky things, heavy, dirty, stacked up on shelves, and they can be challenging to deal with. So developing an archaeology collection then, we're going to quickly look at how we collect archaeology. We're going to look at the really key piece of um, policy that will guide us in developing our collection, and that's the collection development policy, and look at some legal and ethical considerations, and then touch on human remains as well. So the ways that we acquire archaeology, there are lots of different ways this can be done. By far, the most material we acquire is through um, local archaeological excavations today. Um, but we, we do get other sorts of material in for acquisition. These can be private donations, so people just offering things that they have discovered themselves. Sometimes this is through the Portable Antiquity Scheme, which is going to be touched on again later on, going to be talked about. But developing a relationship with the Portable Antiquity Scheme can be really beneficial in that regard. Um, sometimes we're offered things for sale, again, sometimes through the Portable Antiquity Scheme, sometimes not. Sometimes we get material transferred from other institutions. So I'll get a, a phone call from a museum who have found a material in their store that's related to Leeds in some way, and it seems more appropriate that it would be in our store rather than theirs because we'll probably use it um, more than they will. So transfers can come in. Treasure, which Gail will talk about, is another way we um, acquire material. And then there's auction as well. I haven't personally ever bought anything at auction, but lots of my colleagues in Leeds have done in the past um, and I think you said at the last one that you've definitely been to auction for um, various objects and we always practice due diligence which I will um, come on to in a moment so obviously purchasing objects requires a budget which often uh, we can struggle with acquisitions budgets some places have them some places don't but I suspect they've decreased even if um, people do have budgets so being able to fundraise for acquisitions is really um, a key thing to think about. We have lots of locals. We have four main local societies in Leeds, which are called our museum-friendly societies, and they are um, quite generous, often giving us grants to purchase things for the collection. But then there's the larger fundraising bodies as well for um, items of significance. And... Um, we always have to be aware, obviously, we'll, I'll come on to this in a moment, but about objects from overseas. So we... We last at Leeds purchased a group of objects from Egypt in 2004, which seems quite recent, but the objects were already in Leeds and had been for a long time and already had links to our collection. So we do sometimes acquire things from overseas, but that is not our main um, focus. Our main focus is the archaeology of Leeds these days. And um, last year we got a transfer from our school loan service, which um, closed down. And again, quite an unusual transfer, something we weren't expecting but we got a lot of objects from uh, archaeological objects from overseas because again they were already part of Leeds City Council and already here um, and had been for a long time. So when you're thinking about collecting you have to think is it in your collecting policy? So according to accreditation standards, so the standard that 
or museums should have. Um, your collection development policy must include what the museum is all about, your statement of purpose, an overview of what you already have in your collections, and themes and priorities for future collecting. Um, and also for rationalisation and disposal as well, so it's not just one way. Um, you have to think about um, how you're going to manage the collection to the future, and often responsible management will involve looking at disposal. And also information about legal and ethical frameworks for acquiring and disposing of items, and when you'll next review your policy. So we review our policy every five years, I believe it is, at Leeds. So we basically write a collections development vision for the next five years into our policy, and that can contain many different things. So in, in our Leeds policy, and it is available on the Leeds Museums Gallery's website, there is a, um, a section about our policies, and you can access all of these things because they're publicly accessible. We say lots of different things in our policy, like the core of future collecting will continue to be archaeological material from within Leeds Metropolitan District. So we're basically saying we are collecting archives from excavations in our collecting area uh, for the next five years um, to be reviewed soon. Sometimes we write in things that are a bit more specific, like I've written in that lo local and regional prehistoric pottery is quite important for our collection because we don't have it very well represented. I've also written in that medieval finds representing the lay community is important for us because we have a big medieval collection um, which is monastic to do with our abbey site, but we don't have a lot representing the lay community. So it's looking at our collection and thinking where are the gaps, where would we like to expand and really like concentrate on what we want to do. I've also written into our collection that we want our collections policy that we want to develop our relationship with the Portable Antiquities Scheme and that we will consider items of treasure. Um, we are not bound to collecting treasure. We can treat treasure like anything else coming through um, our collections development process. But I've written it in so it gives me an extra backup if I really want to go for treasure. I've written it in the policy that we consider treasure for our collection. But we're definitely not um, bound to collect treasure. There should be something about human remains, about whether you're collecting human remains um, and e extra ethical considerations and some kind of point towards your human remains policy. And you reserve the right to refuse, so you don't have to take anything for the collection. I think the collections policy is really important because it gives you that extra um, backup when you want to acquire something, but it's also really, really useful if you want to say no to something as well. Um, it gives you that sort of framework when you have to sensitively refuse a donation that someone offers to you, that can be quite difficult. But if it's written into your policy and it's an institutional decision, it kind of gives you that extra um, clout to refuse in a sensitive way. And we have had collections development vision for international archaeology as well. We have statements about, you know, we, our focus is Leeds um, collecting, Leeds archaeology. But we are open to acquiring overseas archaeological material where ethically appropriate and where it would complement our existing collections. So we're not saying that we're going out there looking for Egyptology, but if it was offered to us and it was seen as a bonus to our collection and it was all done ethically, then we're not saying that we are also going to say no. So we're leaving it open um, for these decisions. And we take, every one of us has to take our um, potential acquisitions to a monthly meeting in Leeds, so we all present what we'd like to acquire for the collection why it's seen as significant, how we would use it, where we would store it, because these are really practical things. Is it literally going, is it going to fit into the store? How are you going to use it? Is it it's not just going to sit there for the next 50 years um, without anybody looking at it. Uh, and then we, it gets accepted or rejected based on the panel. So sometimes things are taken because we want the panel to say no, but most of the time we take things because we want the panel to say yes. And um, that's how generally it works. So when you're collecting and you're collecting for your local area, you have to think, is it actually in your collecting area? And I'm pointing towards the um, collections map, which is on the Archaeology Data Service website, where you can go on and click on your area, and it will give you a list of museums in that area, and it will tell you at, for each museum whether or not they are collecting archives and whether or not they have a curator responsible for those archives and who that contact person is. So there are sort of big gaps of collecting. So another thing to consider, is it ethical or legal? 
So looking at the um, Museums Association website, it's all about um, for all those who work in museums, upholding principles of whether things are ethical or legal. So it's about stewardship and integrity. It's not just about looking at the ethics of where the objects have come from. You have to think about, can you look after it? Are you able to look after it to um, a high standard? So I would really recommend that you look at that and um, are familiar with that, the code, the code of ethics. And have you practiced due diligence? So this is, a, again, a museum accreditation standard. We have to have made reasonable efforts to check that um, the object has not been acquired in or exported from its country of origin in, viol in violation of that country's laws. So we have to um, abide by the UNESCO Convention for any material, and we have to show that we have investigated and we know that we are acting with integrity when we acquire any material. And there's cultural property advice as well. Um, on the uh, Collections Trust website, there's lots of content about this kind of advice about stolen artworks and how things have been moved around. Um, a lot of the time when dealing with excavations, we don't have to deal with this kind of thing, but it's good to know that it's there and where to go to if there are any questions or if you ever think there's a red flag um, that where you should turn to. And does it include human remains? Um, so human remains, uh, you should have a human remains policy in place, ideally to deal with human remains, and I'll talk about that right at the end. But if you're accepting archives with human remains, um, you have to be named on the license as the repository, and you have to consider things like the Human Tissue Act and whether human remains are reflected in your collections policy. So like I said, if you're going to openly collect human remains, you should have it written in your collections policy. We certainly do at Leeds. We do collect human remains as part of an archaeological archive um, if we are named as, um, if the recommendation is for it to come to a, a recognised repository. So managing an archaeology collection then. We're going to quickly touch on um, acquisition, objects coming into the museum, documentation and movement control, so keeping track of where your things are, marking and labelling of archaeological material. We'll look at conservation and storage, best practice and how to store your material. We'll look a little bit at rationalisation and disposal. So if you actually want to um, deaccession things from the collection and move things out of the collection. And then access for researchers and loans as well. Because it's all very good looking after things, it's, but it's trying to make sure that they're accessible for the people who actually want to, to see them. And I just I included this slide just because um, I think Gail mentioned it before. If you go onto the Collections Trust website and you look for the latest guidance on the care and management of archaeological collections, you will see that it was published in 1992. And I love this wording that comes with it. It, it does give a warning that the practices recommended in the publication may no longer reflect best practice. So everything is very out of date, which is why at the SMA, we are working towards producing sort of new up-to-date guidelines for everybody. So there's not much out there in terms of a, um, one document for the guidelines, but it's something that SMA are working to produce. But the first port of call really for guidelines and best practice really is the um, Collections Trust website. There's all sorts of resources on there in terms of collections management um, and lots of spectrum related resources. So spectrum is the standard to which you should document museum objects. It's not specifically for archaeology, it's for all museum collections. Basically, it's so you know what you have and where it is, and you can look after it accordingly. I'm not going to talk a lot about archives, but just to flag up that when archives, you've decided to acquire an archive and an archive is brought to the museum for deposition, it's really important to have everything prepared in advance. So. You need to inspect, and Deb will show you what a good archive looks like, but in, in accordance with your deposition policy, um, you should check everything that comes into the museum. You should have a checklist and check everything, make sure everything's up to standard, because you can send an archive back if it isn't up to your standards. Check things like transfer of title um, and the copyright waiver, which should be signed over to the museum. Often the 
unit who excavates might not be the owner, so just to double check that, but Deb will go through that in her, in her session. And issue an invoice for your deposition charge. Um, depositing an archive is different from somebody bringing in a donation of an object to the museum. So lots of things to consider because it's a, often a huge amount of material and should come with lots of additional things. The good thing about the... Um, Just check. Oh, yeah, right, okay. Object entry. So, someone brings an object to the museum for acquisition. Every object coming in should have an object entry form and be logged. And then, not just if you're going to keep it permanently, but also if an object's coming in on loan or you're doing an identification, um, it should be logged. And an object entry form provides a receipt, which is really important for the person who's brought it. It's a paper trail. And then you can log um, exactly what has come in to your museum. If something is going to be acquired by the museum, you also have a transfer of title where the owner signs the title of that object over to you. And there usually can't really be any... Sometimes I have people saying, oh, I'll, I'll give it to you if you put it on display. Often you can't make those kind of compromises. So certainly we do not make those kind of compromises. We will say it may go on display, it may not, but we will ensure that it is accessible to everybody if they want to come and see it, if they want to research it. That's the, the thing that we can promise. We can't promise that things will be on display. But that's where somebody signs that object over to the care of the museum to be part of the museum collection. So when objects arrive at the museum, there's lots of things to think about. Think about conservation. Does the object need any conservation? Is it okay as it is? You also have to be aware of hazardous materials that can come into the collection. And this, I'm not sure, when was this, did this come out, Gail? Case okay, so the hazard, Hazardous uh, Museum, it's, it's a right, southeast. It's, recent. it's yeah. recent, isn't it? I haven't even read through it properly yet. It's, um, I would recommend you look through that because it's, it sort of lists all the potential hazardous materials that can enter your collection and you need to sort of mitigate against anything that can come into your collection which may be, be hazardous. I just want to add something just there. It's particularly important for archaeological archive material that you have talked to the unit about potential contamination on city centre sites which may be contaminated with asbestos. So if there is demolition that's gone on site, those buildings may or may not have contained asbestos in the past. So they should have a safe mm. management uh, policy for working in that way. And then literally last week, myself and a colleague went to visit somebody who collected material that was being stored in a place which was lined with white asbestos. So you need to understand that there are risks with archaeological material. It's not just the more modern materials that you need to think about, it's the management of that process. So when the object comes in, it's like processing objects for um, all departments of the museum. You have to follow spectrum standards. So taking legal ownership of objects, especially to add to your long-term collection through the process of accessioning, which is the formal commitment by your governing body to care for objects over the long term. So we um, write the object into the accession register and give it a unique accession number, which all museums do. Um, I think we've just highlighted their GDPR because we're handling people's personal data when we take objects from people. And it's just to be aware that we need to be really careful about how we store um, people's personal data in, in accordance with GDPR. On the SMA website, we have um, a little bit about GDPR for dealing with archaeological archives. Um, each object that comes in should have an object history file. So um, in that file for that object, you can keep all copies of paperwork, transfer of title, entry forms, anything that might have come in related to identification of the object through the Portable Antiquities, Portable Antiquities Scheme. Um, really, the paper trail <laughs> for that object. Keep everything together. And um, Archaeological Archives, just got at the bottom there, is a, is a slightly different procedure. Um, I, it leads, anyway, I'll give an archive a well, one accession number for the whole archive and I will write it in the register. But then how we then process 
there was potentially 150 boxes is a, a separate, a separate um, way to do things. What you want to avoid when you catalogue your objects into your accession register are things like this. And these are examples from the 1800s, um, so I can uh, talk about them because they're not around anymore. But when we look at our old accession registers, our old entries, I love entries like this. 120 coins, an ancient coin, etc., etc. I don't know what the exceptions are in any way, um, and because they're not marked, I'll never be able to find that out. Things like Roman skull and coins, which coins, no idea. Several fragments of pottery and other remains. That's very descriptive. Absolutely no idea what those are. So you, what you want to do is be, um, be quite prescriptive about what it is you're taking into the museum, and then I'll get on to marking, so at least you know what it is when you find it. I spend a lot of my time doing detective work, and I'm sure you all do in museums, trying to pair together <coughs> what objects you've got written down that have come into your museum and what's actually there. And the two often do not match in any way, certainly um, where I've worked in the past. And when objects come in, each object obviously should have a catalogue record. This is a screenshot of TMS, which is what we use in Leeds, which is the museum system. Obviously, there are lots of other databases. Um, I've used Key Emu before when I worked at Manchester. There's Modes and Multimimsy and I'm sure a whole range of others that basically do the same thing. Um, and it's about each object having a record and being able to track for that object to say what it is and where it is. Archaeological archives, again, are different. But this is a way to manage your information um, about your objects. And there are spectrum standards to what the minimum requirements are in terms of a record um, that is deemed to be up to standard. Um, let me have a look. I knew I'd, I'd put this on because this is a beautiful record. I don't have many like this, to be quite honest. It's a, such a beautiful record. Um, so this has all the information. We have all these different tabs. So this is our front page. But when we, um, I don't have a pointer, but in the top left there, you can see curator approved, and that's ticked. It means when, um, the record is up to a suitable standard, I can tick that box to say this meets spectrum standards. It doesn't mean the record is finished in any way. Obviously, you can keep adding to records forever, um, but you want to record as much as you can um, about the object, about the funding for the object, how you acquired it, how you've used it, where it's published, where it was found, all these different, um, all these different aspects of that object. Yes, sure. For a catalogue record to be spectrum compliant, it doesn't have to be on an all singing, all dancing, no. ready made, off the shelf database. It can actually be a spreadsheet or it can be a proprietary access database. So it can be spectrum compliant. Mm. You don't have to buy one of these. We had access for a long time and then we, we invested in TMS and then we migrated the data over from access to this system. Unfortunately, it didn't all go in the fields that we wanted it to. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I've used access for a long time. And, and as I say, as long, if you know what it is and where it is, access can work um, very well. And actually, that's on a, a slide coming up, I think, the, the access database. Um, so again, archaeological archives are different. The way I do it in Leeds is I give each box a a part of a like a, a record an, an accession record on the system per box describing what's in it and when I have time I go back and I when I can do the small finds individually um, so I give them bulk numbers basically but there's ways of doing it where you have a pair on these sorts of systems where you have a parent record and a child record and you can link them all together there's lots of different ways you can do it but there's a real difference between giving an individual object um, a record and then doing a bulk record for a box of pottery. But it, but it does the same job. It tells you what's there and where it is. And that's the really important thing, that you have a, a grasp of what you have in your collections. And this is what Gail was saying about inventories. Um, you need the basic information. It doesn't have to be on an all-singing, all-dancing database. Um, it can be on a spreadsheet. And you just have to be able to be accountable for the objects in your care, so kind of know what's in your collection, and you have to be able to tackle that backlog, so know what needs to be done. And we all have backlogs. We all have huge um, documentation backlogs. 
mystery material as well. Um, so that's what I was talking about, about doing detective work. It's where to look when your database doesn't tell you what an object is. So if you're doing retrospective documentation and you're going through your stores and you just find some objects, we have a great um, button on our database which just says found in store. And that's, you know, how is this acquired, found in store? I don't know. It's just there and it always has been as far as I'm aware. Um, I have no idea who brought it in. I don't know where it came from. So it's where to look for how to research these mystery objects that are just in your store. And it's looking at, is it marked? Is there any number on it whatsoever? You can go through um, your old accession registers and see if there's anything that seems to fit the bill. There's lots of grey literature um, you can go through for archaeological material. Is it with any other objects? Is there any link with any person? Sometimes you can glean a bit of information. Sometimes you can't. You can exhaust all options and still not quite know what it is. And we all have those. I'm going to pop to movement control there. Um, so, and movement control is really important as well because you need to know not just what your objects are, but where they are, um, and update the location each time an object is moved. And I think every institution does this slightly differently. I think it leads, if we are taking an object out, out for the day to do some handling and then putting it back the same day, that's fine. If we take something and it's going to be moved for more than a day, we update the record on the database, we fill out an object movement ticket and physically put it in the box. Um, so there are different ways to track where an object is. And it is time consuming to, to, to move objects on the system, especially if your systems are really slow like ours are, you can spend a long, long time. To, but it's really, really important, obviously, to keep track of where things are. And another way to keep track of where things are is marking. And I will say that I really like Bristol's um, marking guidelines that they have. I'm, I'm going to steal those for leads because they're very comprehensive. Um, so every, each accession item or appropriate group of items should be marked or labelled with its permanent accession number without damaging the object. So the idea is that um, the accession number should be written on the object in a, a discrete location on a, a smooth surface where it's easier to write on, which isn't going to be, ideally isn't going to be in sort of damage, making the object look bad if it's on display, um, where it's not going to rub off or be abraded by another object. But the idea is when you're marking an object properly, it is reversible. So if there is a, a mistake, you can remove the number and move it elsewhere. Um, it's really important to write the full accession number, which I found when, because um, often in Leeds, we have lead M as our main part of our number, and then it's all a sequential year-by-year -year numbering system. And often, you're tempted to write it in shorthand and just write D for archaeology, and then the year, and then the number. But we are always encouraged, and, and we should write the full accession number on there, because I had an instant um, about six years ago when UCL rang me and said, I've got some objects in our safe with, the, with lead M. Is that anything to do with Leeds Museums? And it turned out that they had lots of fragments of Neolithic textiles in their safe, which had been on loan since the 1960s. And someone had just put them in the safe, and then someone had come across them. And if that lead M hadn't have been written on there, nobody would have had a clue that they had anything to do with Leeds. So that really sort of taught me that it's really, really important to put the full number. If, if each museum has its own... Um, sort of sign at the front and lead M as ours and that was able to identify us to them and we got the objects back after all those years. Um, I'd marked them as missing on the database, I didn't have a clue where they were and it turned out they were in London the whole time. So um, it is really important to mark and there's different ways you can mark um, your objects, you can get special pens, you can use, um, we often use these sort of metal, metal pens that look a bit like fountain pens where you dip them in the ink, although they can be a little bit scratchy um, and some people are very good at it. Um, I am not. I prefer the pens. There are different ways to mark objects depending on what they are. Some objects you can't mark, like coins, for instance. There is nowhere to write a number on a coin. So it's really important to keep the information and the object together um, at all times. But where possible, marking an object can be a lifesaver. Just think of all those mystery objects in your museums if they all had numbers on how amazing life would be. So it's really important to keep track of those. So collections care, um, how we look after 
our objects. That's the real box from Bristol. That is from Bristol. I love that. It hasn't got objects in it anymore. It's see what it's the art in it. It was available to um, the factory. So. I mean, I found things in our old store at Leeds that were wrapped in carry bags, that were wrapped in old dishcloths, that were wrapped in you know, all sorts. We've all come across um, packaging of all types, I'm sure, in our stores. So it's trying to pack things in a more appropriate way. So materials to avoid. And I've actually brought... Um, I'm completely stepping out of the line of uh, being filmed here. But I've brought some of these with me in case anybody wants to browse them to some of the advice sheets you get online um, about material for storage and display and they're really really useful if anyone wants to browse these afterwards it gives you a list of the ideal storage for all different types of material that you'd deal with in archaeology and I will um, and I have examples with me and many of you will know a lot of this material but I thought I would pass it around things like Stuart boxes for um, Metal work, so creating a dry box environment. Crystal boxes for smaller objects, which you can often um, cut into plastazote, which I will pass around. So this is plastazote. You can cut into that. You can pass that around. Acid-free tissue. These finds bags with the white strips, ideally, um, so you can write on what is in the bag. And I've also got things like object movement tickets and pest traps, things that we use, and a little crystal box as well, and a humidity strip, which I'll come on to in a minute. I just want to say at that point, there have been some discussions recently on social media about alternatives to using plastics and polyesters mm. for storage of materials. In terms of the long care, care storage and care conservationally, those materials are still not superseded by any other material mm. for long-term care of archaeological collections. The biggest source of damage to a, an object is mechanical damage, which means taking it in and out of the bag, handling anything which is see-through that allows you to handle an object, which yeah. uses the possibility. And if you think about it's not a single use because that single use could span 30, 50, 100 years. Um, and th there is no other material. There are tests that have been done on um, vegetable, glazed plastics, etc. That none of those are coming up to the standard that is required. So, just want to add: do mm. not be tempted to suddenly revert back to paper bags or cotton bags, thinking that you're doing the environment a favour. It's very true because if you get the, if you get the storage right, then these can last for. An a very very long time and with archaeological material the idea is that you don't want them to, to you want them to be still and to be supported in the boxes and not to be rubbing on each other but as Gail said the things that damage objects the most is going in and out of packaging handling things in and out of bags so anything that can reduce that is going to be of a benefit to the collections so we have quite large um, acid-free boxes and we use acid-free tissue to make almost like little nests for objects and they're really well padded but you don't have to sort of pick them up and start unwrapping them like a Christmas present because that can be really damaging and that's when accidents happen um, with collections. So it's really about being able to move the box around for the objects to be supported and not rubbing on each other and as accessible as possible. And um, all sort of object types have different storage conditions. These are the ideal storage conditions. We all have different types of stores um, and the extent to which we can match these conditions will obviously vary. But these are the ideal, um, the ideal conditions for all these different metal types. So um, I think it's on the next slide, but with metals, you can create a microclimate within the box, which can uh, be drier for metals, which is obviously much better. Bulk finds, the main thing with bulk ceramics um, and that kind of material is that the temperature and the relative humidity is constant. The worst thing, for your collections is if your humidity and temperature is going up and down and changing all the time that's where the damage happens keeping it constant is really really key metals um, many places have separate metal stores we don't at Leeds they're on the racks um, with everything else but we have one big climate controlled store which I think is kept at 16 degrees and about 45% relative humidity um, we do have a separate store for 
spirit, um, objects in spirit. And human remains, again, um, human remains should be in a secure storage accessed only by authorised staff, ideally. Um, certainly in Leeds, we don't, our human remains are in our main store, but they're down the bottom of one of the racks, which shouldn't really be accessed by anybody other than staff. We don't have anywhere else, we don't have another room to put them in, so we've done our best with what we have. And um, storage of sensitive materials, I've seen the time, uh, I better hurry up here. So we have on the left, that's how you make basically your dry box, you have your Stuart box for metals, you have um, a humidity strip and silica gel, um, and you, you have to seal that lid, it's really important, every time you go in and out of a Stuart box, make sure that lid is, is sealed. Um, gloves, people have asked me quite a few times recently what sort of gloves you use. I find the cotton gloves snag on things, snag on corrosion. Um, what, what, what sort of gloves do you use in Bristol? Nitrile. Yeah, we do. We use the nitrile ones as well. We oh, don't really use... They can be really difficult with ceramics. Yeah. Uh, they can be really difficult with corroded metalwork. They do. And they snag um, on human remains. and quite slippy on polished stone. Mm. People always wanted to wear white gloves in photographs, but they're not the most practical things. Um, so, and these are examples of Stuart boxes with um, the white plaster zone and objects mounted in them. So we often do this with coins that we want to pass around with, say, school groups. We can pass things around really safely. You can see both sides, but they're really secure, and the object itself is not being handled, which means it will last a lot longer. Um, and bulk materials. Um, as we said, ideally in darkness um, and at a constant temperature. And there's also lots of specific advice for things like if you can take waterlogged material, um, keeping them wet at all times. And things like oversized objects. We have, a, we have special racks that are low down for our really heavy, bulky things. Um, but I have found some really heavy, bulky things high up on the racks. We have to actually drive a scissor lift to get to the top of our racks, and I found some really heavy things up there, which is slightly ridiculous. So we're looking at um, reordering things all the time. So it's a health and safety issue for yourselves. Not, it's not just about the objects being safe, it's about you being safe accessing them. That's really, obviously, really important. And with um, archives comes lots of paperwork and plans as well. So it's looking at how to... Um, how to store written material, drawings, and photographs. And human remains, as I said, should be, um, should technically be stored separately um, and be packed as individuals. And this is something we've had to work through at Leeds because a lot of our human remains collections are packed as individuals, but then we have some excavations from the 70s where you have individuals across several boxes or more than one individual in a box, and they should be recognised as an individual. So we're currently actually working through that at Leeds. And making the most of space, I mean, roller racking is, um, is fantastic for space saving. As I say, our, our shelves go right to the ceiling and we have a scissor lift, which is uh, slightly terrifying to drive, but um, it means that we can get to everything safely. And for all the, the photographs I've showed you of the lead store, this is also the lead store. Heavy things on high shelves, boxes that are falling apart, horrible sellotape falling off everything, things scrolled on there but not actually telling you what's inside. So we've all got lots and lots of, um, of, work, of work to do. And to highlight that there are disposal toolkits um, available online as well for the Museums Association. So if you want to get rid of collections and disposal is not a negative thing it can mean a transfer out to another institution it can mean um, deaccessioning it to be used with schools there's lots of reasons why you want, might want to dispose and certainly at Leeds we have a, a whole deaccessioning and disposal process where we have to get people higher up than us to sign it off um, I think the reason that we dispose of things the most is purely because of conservation things that are literally falling apart and we have um, disposed of a, a number of those things Myself and Gail were also on the, um, the group, the working group for the Rationalisation Project, which was funded by Historic England, where we did um, a study of rationalisation in order to save space in stores. And there were five institutions who took part, one of them being Museums Worcestershire, which, which Deb's from. She was one of our pilot project leaders. 
and each institution looked at their archaeology collection or parts of it and looked at rationalising that collection and what that actually meant in terms of resources and money and how much space they actually saved in doing so. And um, spoiler alert, the um, big headlines were that the scoping study is worth doing, so actually doing the audit to find out what you actually have is completely worth doing for every institution, really, really useful. But rationalisation won't necessarily release huge amounts of space and it's resource heavy. So it costs a lot, lots of people were involved to get collections up to a standard needed to make those decisions about whether or not you should dispose. So um, that was what the conclusions were, but it's a really, really helpful document. It's available on the SMA website and it gives lots of guidance points. So if you're considering rationalisation, it's basically, if this is what you want to do, these are the things that you have to think about before you do it. So it's a useful thing to, to look through. And other things to have in place as well for archaeology, we have a lot of um, research visits. We at Leeds have research application forms, they're really basic forms that people write down their details when they're going to come and look at something. But the idea for research visits to access collections is to get an agreement that at the end of it, because you're giving researchers your time and access to the collections, is to make sure that there's an agreement that at the end of it they're going to give their research back to you um, and that's what because you, you're sharing in that research um, I've not been the best at chasing up researchers I must admit I try and keep a log of who's in I've got all my application forms and every now and again I'll chase people but it's, it's quite demoralizing when you give researchers maybe three days of your time and then you never hear from them again um, so make sure you get something in place that you're going to benefit from that and get the latest research that's been done in your collection so then you can use it and share it and um, use it in your own practice as well. Destructive sampling requests, you may get these. Um, we get a few, maybe two or three a year in Leeds where people ask to take a sample of an object for, a, for a, a research project. And this is something that you need to make, a decision that you need to make as a group to decide whether the destruction of that object or part of that object is worth the research that's going to come out of it at the end. But I will say that destructive sampling nowadays really seems to be tiny, tiny amounts, like milligrams of material, which is fantastic. Because I've got, and I'm sure many of you have seen the axe heads with, with huge slices just like cut out of them. Because in the past, people needed quite a lot of material to do anything, uh, any scientific analysis. Nowadays, luckily for us, usually just a tiny, tiny bit. So that, that makes a big difference. But um, do sort of weigh those requests up and say no if you feel that that object is at risk and you feel that that's not something that you um, want to be a part of. So it's really making sure that not only do you know what you have and where it is, but that you can make it accessible to people who want to come and do lots of lovely work on it and actually you will then benefit at the end from all that wonderful research. And obviously loans going out um, to other institutions for display or for scientific analysis, which is non-destructive or lots of other reasons. Um, you've got to consider all those things as well. Obviously, that's not just archaeology. So I'm going to really, really briefly, because I haven't got very long, touch on human remains now, that are human remains policy. It's really important if you have human remains in your collection to have a policy which really outlines your approach to looking after your policy and how you're going to, to do that. Our policy is available on our website. It's, our policy is quite brief. I think it's only sort of three, three sides. And we describe the human remains that we have in our collections and where they've mainly come from. And we look at things like how we approach display and use of material and access for researchers and things like photography. And our human remains policy covers everything that is to do with human remains. So it's not just archaeological material, it's not just human skeletons and human mummies. It's world cultures, like a human femur made into a trumpet. It's social history. We have false teeth made out of real teeth. We have mourning jewellery with a lock of human hair. So it covers all of those um, types of material. And we have changed our policy relatively recently. Um, so this is the skeletons exhibition, sorry, that we, that we did with the Welcome Collection, which came down in 2018, where we put lots of skeletons on display from our collections um, and research into our human remains collection. 
So really briefly, we've changed our human remains policy recently because, because of this display, we actually decided to ask our visitors about how they felt about human remains in museums and should visitors be allowed to take photographs and share images of human remains in museums, which has always been quite a contentious issue. We never allowed photography of human remains on display at all at Leeds. And then we did this piece of research and uh, these are our results. So we can see that, um, and you can read the full report of all this research on our website, but you can see that people in Leeds 2017 to 2018 were, were very much in favour, um, our visitors were very much in favour of human remains being in museums for display and research. People still in favour of photography of human remains, but less so, more conflicted about photography um, and whether people should be allowed to take photographs. But it's very nuanced, there's lots of different caveats within those, they're very, very broad statistics, there's lots of concerns within those um, within those percentages. But it gives us a bit of confidence now to say, actually, we're changing our policy. You're now allowed to take photographs of human remains. We're going to flag up and say that you have to, you know, respectful photography only. And we have statistics to back those decisions up, which is really good for us. Because I think we've always been slightly nervous about what to do with our human remains collections because of the worries of some sort of ethical backlash. Um, so it's really important to have sort of made those decisions as an institution about how you're going to approach um, human remains. And we certainly, we have a human remains working group. So anything that comes in, anyone who wants access to human remains for any reason, destructive sampling, requests for loan, anything goes through that working group. And it's just about having that extra level of consideration um, to make sure that you're making ethical decisions. So these are the changes that we made on the back of that project. So we now allow photography. We're much more proactive in using our remains. Um, and we're reboxing our remains um, so they're more in line with uh, best practice. And I'm, this is literally one slide on numismatics because we don't have time to talk about it, but we are SMA and we um, represent the Subject Specialist Network for Archaeology. The Money and Medals Network is our equivalent in numismatics and they are really lovely. Henry Flynn uh, heads up the Money and Medals Network, he's really great. He's great for giving advice um, on what to do, how to store objects. He'll happily come and visit your collection and give you really good, um, good advice. Like on the left, we have a lot of our collections. A lot of them are not like this. They're in horrible boxes. But on the left, we have lots of things in trays. And his first thing was just get rid of the felt because the felt off gases over time and can tarnish your coins. So at the moment, actually, I have a project placement in. And he, I hope he still likes me. He's been getting rid of a lot of felt over the last sort of, three or four weeks. Um, so we're sort of going through that. So they're a really, really good resource for anything to do with coins and medals, which um, may be part of your wider archaeology collection. In the last few minutes, I'm just going to skip through some places to go for further information. This might test my knowledge of um, all the abbreviations that we have to know. So subject specialist networks, of which SMA are one. There is um, the consortium for subject specialist networks, which Gail heads up. Um, which now have their own website, so that's your first port of call for anything collections related, and it represents how many SSNs? Over, it's like 22, so you can get access to all 22, the information on how to contact them. Uh, there's stuff on there about events, news, etc. And the biggest piece of news recently is that we managed to get money from the Art Fund to get some administrative support and some resources about how you administer a network and governance. Mm. Us, obviously, Society for Museum Archaeology um, website. As I say, you can contact um, any of us for advice about anything and we'll certainly, if we don't know ourselves, we will find the right people to help. Archaeological archives, of which I've actually brought hard copy with me today, so if you want to browse through it, actually it's got my sticky notes in it, so ignore them, but um, please do have a browse through. Great guidance for best practice in, um, in dealing with archives. We have CIFA, the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, who, do, who represent field archaeologists in the field, as well as all other archaeologists. The British Association for Job, no, Archaeological Jobs Resource. Yes, right, it's really testing me. Um, for yeah, yeah, archaeological um, jobs, have a look at the, that website. An icon for conservation, lots of guidance on there, lots of fact sheets about um, 
standards for collections care, and the Portable Antiquity Scheme, which will be covered a little bit later. Really great website, um, really great database. I find it really useful for identifying finds and finding similar collections elsewhere um, on the database quite a lot. And there's lots of fact sheets on there as well, which are really, really useful. And the Hazards in Museum Collections um, that I mentioned earlier, which is fairly recent as well. And Collections Trust, obviously, for all um, spectrum standards and documentation and collections care is a really key, um, key website. And the SMA guidance, will that be going on collections? That's on there, that's on there, that's on there already. already. Brilliant. OK, I think that's me done with, look at that. It's half fast. Thank you very much.